joining me again um, and uh, thanks for coming to learn a little bit more about diving into the caching technologies that we talked a little bit about uh, in the keynote. Who's used um, the build cache for Gradle before? All right, a few of you. How about for Maven? Okay. Who, who knew that there was an open source Maven build cache available? Okay, a few of you. So, now you know, uh, it's good. The community provided one, uh, I want to say, October-ish uh, of last year, and it's similar to the one that, um, uh, that's that been provided by the commercial Gradle tooling for a while. So we're going to talk about all that stuff. All right, um, me, Justin Reak, Chief Evangelist, Field CTO, Gradle, hi. Um, <laughs> this is the statement that I want to start with here. Um, it's essential wisdom, especially amongst the DevOps community. This has become sort of a rallying cry for the DevOps community over the last five years or so. Uh, pretty well-known quote, it's no longer the big beating the small, but the fast beating the slow. Eric Pearson, CIO of uh, IHG, Intercontinental Hotels Group. What does this statement mean? It means it's no longer the giant like mega corporations and things that are like always controlling the narrative, right? If you really look, it's the disruptive fast and agile companies that are able to respond to customer and client feedback very quickly or respond to the trade winds of the community or really just be able to add cool new features and get them to market fast, all right? And that's a lot of what we're gonna be talking about right now. Uh, DevOps talks a lot about speeding up delivery of software and that's important, right? I talked in the keynote about the uh, relationship between throughput and success, right? And the reason that DevOps wants to shrink the amount of time between the work and cost of writing the code and the code being out in the world creating money for that business is all about reducing throughput, right? And the build is part of that, right? The, the, the amount of the, the time that a developer has to spend waiting on a build cycle to complete or a test cycle to complete, whether locally or in CI, which we'll talk about today, is part of that delivery. It's part of that value stream. But it's missed a lot. We don't look at it a lot, right? I think we don't look at it a lot because it's so tied to the build tool. A lot of us, and I will not take any offense to this, don't want to think about the build tool. We just want it to stay out of our way and work and do what it's supposed to do, right? But actually, the time spent uh, by the build tool working and creating the artifact and getting ready for delivery is a very important part of the value stream, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, we already saw this one. Same joke. <laughs> uh, we don't want to spend a lot of time waiting on builds uh, and tests to complete, and we definitely don't want to spend a lot of time uh, inefficiently debugging problems with our builds or dealing with test flakiness, right? We want to spend time uh, in our flow state, in the, 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 the part of this whole experience uh, that, that gives us joy. And, and, and this is one of those technologies that's going to allow us to do that. Uh, this is a pretty recent survey that came out. Um, the GitHub uh, folks put, the, put this out. It was part of a, a, a survey talking about developer experience came out in June of, of this year. And unsurprisingly, at the top of the list of concern, uh, it was just developers waiting for builds and tests, right? Just as much as writing new code. So I, I think we can do better. Uh, we did our own survey, uh, found pretty much the same thing. Uh, before implementing DPE practice, before implementing things to improve developer experience, um, where was the organization experiencing pain points? And 92% of respondents said that it was too much time waiting on build or test feedback, uh, either locally or during CI. Okay, so this is a known pain, right? We're, we're solving something that's, that's felt. We may not be complaining about it enough, and hopefully, um, if you've been listening, you, you learned that you deserve to complain about something like this that we can certainly improve, right? And this is, this is one, one way that we can do that. Um, it is part of this bigger story around developer productivity engineering, which we which touched on in the, in the keynote, but to make it a little bit more real, we take an engineering approach to productivity. There's lots of approaches to productivity, too many approaches to productivity. Some of them are great, some of them not so much. But what this one is saying is that we don't really want to focus so much on leaning on the person. We want to look at the tool chain. We want to make sure that the tool chain is not providing, uh, uh, presenting a bunch of impediments to productivity for the developer. We want to apply telemetry to the developer experience. We want to look at it, examine it, analyze it, and figure out where we can optimize it. Um, if you forgive a really terrible metaphor that actually does a pretty good job explaining it, whereas a lot of productivity frameworks might focus on the driver of a car, 
Productivity engineering focuses on the car itself, the road, uh, and the environment in which that driver is racing. Uh, we address a lot of different pain points. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I, I definitely could. Um, but really, we're focusing on improving wait time and context switching situations for developers, as well as inefficient failure troubleshooting. We are dealing with flaky tests and other types of avoidable failures, especially like infrastructure failures. Just not having any metrics or KPI observability. And I know this is true because I asked everybody during the keynote, who's looking at local build times? A few of you, congratulations. Still, like 10 or 15, a dozen, maybe, right? Uh, and then inefficient use of CI resources. Right? So these, these pains exist, and what DPE hopes to present are solutions across the spectrum for all of these things, right? Um, but what we're going to talk about today is just within the realm of acceleration, and specifically within the realm of build caching. But I just don't want anyone to think that that's all this is, right? There's a number of practices that involve acceleration, observation, and analytics that collectively uh, to put together would be this practice of productivity engineering, and it's evolving and growing and continuing to, uh, uh, to um, I wouldn't say expand its definition, but refine its definition. All right, fast feedback cycles are important. Uh, we, we, we looked at a flow diagram in the keynote and talked a little bit about context switching, uh, and, and I really love presenting improvements to developer experience and productivity through the lens of joy and creativity because I do think that those are the primary uh, human motivators for creating things and caring about creating things. But let's take a different approach and just look at some math. Um, so team one and team two actually represent real uh, teams, that, the data that we pulled from during trials of Gradle's commercial product. And um, what we saw was that we effectively had two teams here, one with a build time of roughly four minutes. This includes tests. So when we say build time and for the duration of this talk, when I say build, I mean build and test, right? Because I do know that test is 90% in a lot of cases of the build cycle. Uh, and then uh, this team two over here with a one minute uh, build time. We, we, we started tracking the, the, the demographics, or the, excuse me, the demographics, the, the data that I talked about earlier, some of the metrics that are important for understanding developer experience, and here's what we found. This team of 11 developers with a four minute build time uh, was performing about 850 builds a week. And we said earlier that, that builds are a good thing. It's a dialogue with the tool chain about whether you did a good job, right? You're getting feedback on the quality of your work. So the more often you can do this, conceivably, theoretically, the better, the more often you have an opportunity to refine your work, right? So this 850 builds in this week-long period, that's what this is meant to represent. When compared to a team of six, a little more than half the size, with a one-minute build time, this team of six is performing over 1,000 builds in the same span of time. Arguably, that's better, right? They're able to perform more builds, refine their work more frequently, even though the team is just slightly more than half the size. Two things to take away from here. Who's complaining about a four minute build time right now? Nobody. <laughs> a lot of you are probably thinking four minutes sounds pretty good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't have to, you know. I know, I know. Um, but look what happens when we take it down to one minute. Story doesn't end there. As fast as it can possibly be. Not fast enough. As fast as it can possibly be. That's the mentality, right? When we do that, look at this team of six performing 1,000 builds a week, taking a build time from one minute down to 0.6 minutes, returning 44 engineering days a year of value back to that team of six developers. That's almost two full vacation cycles. Okay. And what about this team of 100 developers running 12,000 builds a week, taking a nine-minute build time, which I hope people are complaining about, down to a five-minute build time? returning 5,200 days of engineering value a year back to that team. All right, so build caching is a technology that can deliver fast build and test feedback cycles. Now, we're at a Java conference. I don't always give this talk at Java conferences. Sometimes people come up and say, what can I do with Python? What can I do with .NET? I say, nothing. You have to go to Java. No. What... <laughs> the, right? End of story. Now, the, the, um, the thing to do if you are using a build tool chain besides Java is to look for this. All right? uh, it was introduced to the Java world in 2017 by Gradle, and like I said, provided by Maven uh, as of uh, pretty recently. But NPM has a build cache. The GCC tool chain has a build cache. NPM has a version of a build cache. There's some Python thing I don't know much about that also is build caching. 
So these are available in other frameworks, and I would just say look for them. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in the keynote again, big takeaway here. Who still thinks that a build cache is uh, an artifact cache or dependency cache or JFrog or Sunatype or any of that? No hands going up, great, my job is done. I'll see you all later. Uh, that is the big takeaway. This is not a dependency cache. We're not talking about Artifactory. I mean, I have given talks where I'm like, yeah, build caching, and at the end they're like, yeah, but we, we tried Artifactory and it didn't solve all the problems. And it's like, no, it's not the same thing. Uh, they're, they're good things. They're just complementary solutions, all right? Complementary to one another. Um, going back to the anatomy, digging into it a little bit further. Um, all of these steps in a build that produce part of the artifact uh, are broken down into subsections of work, units of work. Uh, in, the, in the, the common build tools that are out there. In the world of Gradle, that unit of work is called a task, right? And I can configure that task to do anything, which is good and bad. <laughs> um, the Maven goals are a little bit more uh, um, declarative, uh, but also the same idea. I'm going to pass in a set of inputs and something's gonna happen that's gonna create part of the build, part of the, part of the output, part of the artifact. So caching can work here because it's a finite and understood set of inputs, we can reliably generate a cache key based on those inputs. If those inputs should ever change at all, the cache key will change and invalidate what's in the cache, which is a good thing. So we don't wanna pull invalid chunks of the artifact into our final build. But it also means that it's sensitive. Like for instance, if your code is generating a timestamp, that's gonna invalidate the cache because the source code will have changed between the two different runs. Or if you forgot to normalize paths or directories within the declarations that you're making, yes, that will also cause the cache key to change and you will do a cache miss. So a lot of, uh, a lot of what you'll wanna go away from this talk, although we're not gonna get too deep into the optimization, is that there is a whole discipline around optimization of builds and caching, right? You'll probably turn this thing on and see some good benefit out of the box. Depending on how modular your app is, you'll see more and more, but then also depending on how well-defined and uh, um, obedient the, the build configuration is to the standards for inputs, you, you may also see room where it's like, well, this, ca this task or goal really should be caching, but I keep missing, right? You may have to dive into that a little bit to be able to get that benefit, right? So there's a whole art to, to optimizing the caching you know, beyond what you get out of the box, but it is stuff like that. It's looking for things like, well, are we generating timestamps? Are we using home directory? Those, those are like the top two that our own solutions engineers see all the time. Uh, Code-wise, what does this really mean? Well, let's look at a Java compile task, for instance. Uh, uh, Java compile ta task, uh, we're creating a cache key for this task, and to do that, we're creating a hash of the source code files that are getting passed into this compile task, the JDK major version, uh, the class path and the, uh, any compiler arguments that are passed in. Uh, and then the entry, because this was a compile task, is just gonna create, it's just gonna have a tree of class files, compiled class files in this case, because it was a compiled class. This is the output. So then this becomes what we stick in the cache against the key that we generated from the input. So then in the future, we go run another build, we happen to generate the exact same key because we're using the same source, the same JDK major version, we then can pull that work from cache as opposed to uh, having to rerun that part of the build. Now, if you're really eagle-eyed and paying attention, you realize that the cache key generation uh, using this method is fairly elegant, enough to be distributed and used remotely. In other words, if I was running a build with the exact same source code and JVM environment as some other developer, then I could benefit from their cache entry, okay? Then, I could have a follow the sun team, checking code and commits into CI. I could have CI running the build, and CI could be populating a remote cache node that my first build of the day, even if I'm on a follow the sun model, can benefit from, okay? And we're gonna see that uh, example as well. And it looks like this. So here we have uh, uh, developers doing their thing. They, of course, are in, in, interacting with their local cache but they're pushing things up to CI, and CI is populating a remote cache that's shared. Right? The optimization, of course, really matters here too, right? especially things like path declaration. Right? Because if any developers are using their own home directories and whatever they're checking in or anything like that, that's gonna invalidate the possibility of using a remote cache entry. But this is great 
for getting out of that scenario where, well, as my first executive task of the day, I will wait an hour for my clean build to complete. We can actually get out of that and have fast builds first thing in the morning. Uh, if you're wondering, do I have to pay for this? Uh, no, <laughs> not technically. Um, this uh, cache node, the remote cache node, is sitting out in Docker Hub, ready to be consumed. I'll show you the, the, the command for it. Uh, you can pull it down, you can stand it up, you can cache against it. Uh, you can't run it against an access control list. Okay? Uh, there's going to be other restrictions and things that you might want, bits of governance that aren't going to be available, uh, that are available in, in this. Right? Uh, that's the closest, hopefully, that you'll hear to a sales pitch from me. You all just got pitched. You may not have known that. Uh, so, uh, so this node is available, and that's what these demos are going to be based on. Okay, so yes, you can go and play with this immediately, uh, including CI integration and remote node, ephemeral node integration. All those things will work for you right now using this image. Uh, so some examples of things that can be cached beyond the obvious, like source code files and things. Uh, well, source files, uh, the compiled class path, Java version, these can all be inputs, considered inputs for things that could be cacheable. Um, and it's a generic feature. Uh, it doesn't obviously work on I.O. bound operations like clean or copy. Why would you do that? But uh, for creating uh, you know, chunks of an artifact that you want to then pull in, it can be useful for that. Uh, like I said before, there are the, the Maven community has released a generally available um, build cache node. So all you have to do is load this extension. All right, so drop it into your .maven extensions file or however you uh, configure your extensions. You can pull it. That version's probably off. Uh, I probably pulled the screenshot a little while ago, so do double check that. But it is available, and it's in Maven Central, and it works. Works really well. All right, let's do a quick demo, uh, hopefully, because uh, it looked like the HDMI was a little bit weird. It's going to be really bad if we can't do that and also not have internet. OK. Uh, so for this demo, the first one that I'm going to show you, I'll show you a Maven uh, and a Gradle build. I would show you the build scan. The Wi-Fi is not working. I think that's been said a few times, and I won't make too big a deal of it. Uh, so I will show you a screenshot of the relevant part of a build scan and also show you how to easily generate one on your own for free. Um, so looking at the Gradle code first, this is a super simple app. I think it was like a Gradle spring initializer app, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it was. Um, and uh, so it's just very simple. It has a unit test, but it, the unit test doesn't do anything. It just loads the context. Um, but it's enough to show the, the, the life cycle of a build. All right, so let's do a few things. Let's start like completely clean. Um, I want to, uh, first of all, just blow away my local cache node here. This is where it lives by default. You're seeing the home directory dot gradle caches build cache one that's all fairly visible, kind of, yeah. Um, so I'm going to blow this away. And I also happen to know that my remote cache node is already running, because I wanted to make sure I didn't blow the demo. Uh, and so that um, is going to be running on a local node here. And I want to say 9091 if I did that right. Yes. Uh, and I'll show you how to uh, log into this um, if you choose to go this route. Uh, if you want to do the, um, oh, come on, Justin. If you want to do the, uh, the, like the free um, Docker image route, uh, it's going to generate this wonderful uh, authentication, basic authentication details for you. Uh, so this is now looking at a, you know, a remote cache node. We'll, we'll come back to this in a moment. I just want to purge it for the, for the sake of this demo, because I know that my local code could also be pulling from that, and I don't want it to pull from anything right now. So the first thing we're going to do is a Gradle clean build. All right? What would happen if I did just a regular Gradle build? Anybody familiar with Gradle? If I did it just Gradle build without the clean back and forth, it's incremental on its own. Right? It's, it's aware of tasks that it's run in the past. It's not caching, technically. It's just aware of stuff that doesn't need to be run again. So its incremental nature would take over and say, well, I don't need to run that. But it wouldn't really be demonstrating the cache. So the value proposition for Gradle is in a clean build. So that's why I'm going to run a clean build here. And network error, it's OK. Knew that was going to happen. Uh, build scan failed. Um, but we de did see eight uh, actionable tasks here, tasks that could execute, and, and eight of them ran. Right? Uh, we ended up with about a four-second uh, build time here. 
And I'll, I will show you what the build scan would show us in a moment. But let's run this again. Another clean build. I mean, this one happened in, I mean, less than a second, really, more like, probably more like 600 milliseconds or so. And we were able to pull three of the, 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 the actual tasks from cache, right? These happened to be a Java compile task, a test compile task, and the test task itself. I just know that offhand, but the build scan would have shown us that. Um, so, so that's Gradle. So now we've seen, I mean, again, simple example, but going from four to five second build to sub single second build just out of the box, just by turning on caching. How, how did we do that? I probably should have demonstrated that. Uh, it's just here in um, the gradle.properties file. Uh, this is not turned on by default. Uh, we do realize that 51% of developers do not trust caching, and so it is off by default. Um, but you can turn it on very easily. Uh, gradle.properties org.gradle.caching equals true. There's really not a reason to at least turn this on and see how it works for a build. There's just really not. Right? Uh, you'll get a, a, a good idea uh, of what type of savings potential uh, could be available to you, and then from there make a case as to whether or not you, know, you think that this sh should be something you should roll out and, and test against. Okay? Uh, let's look at Maven. Uh, I have to take that back. We can't look at Maven uh, because we need network entitlement to the, uh, to the remote cache node for Maven. Um, you'll, you'll see similar results there. Going back to, um, uh, to, to try to play the home game uh, for this one, uh, make sure that you uh, took a look at um, what the Maven extension has offered for this. It's, again, very easy uh, to, um, it's very easy to set up and, 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 and perform and get working, uh, and you'll be able to get an idea of your savings uh, right out of the box at the, be at the beginning. Okay, apologies that I can't demo that one. Um, okay, questions on, I forget we can do questions because we're in a smaller group setting. Your questions on, on any of that, local cache, before we start moving on to the remote cache pattern? Um, it's going to, uh, the, the build tool is more restrictive. Yeah, so uh, as long as you're operating within whatever the build tool is defining, you, you should be able to take advantage of the caching. Uh, and the JVM major version uh, is going to be um, part of the input to the cache. So, for instance, building against you know, 21 to 17 would invalidate the cache. Yeah, but not, not, patches. Uh, not patches, no, major version. Yeah, API, major API, API version. Are they including what it says being uh, treated with Gradle Cache? Uh, yes, so there's a whole section in the Gradle uh, documentation around cache normalization. So you look up cache normalization, there's a huge section, it's part of the art of optimizing the cache. You can tell the cache to behave in all number of different ways based on certain things. Maybe, maybe you have something that relies on the timestamp, but you, but you still want to cache other parts of that task. So you could tell it to ignore that and still cache other parts of the output from the artifact and things like that. It's a great question. Yeah. Can you explicitly exclude something from this cache? That is part of normalization as well. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Anything else? Okie dokie. So, uh, this is what it would look like uh, were we actually able to show a build scan. Now, the build scan has tons of information available. Uh, and again, it's free, scans.gradle.com, you can check it out. Um, let me, I don't wanna swap display, I wanna use a slideshow. Sorry, it's switching between like mirroring and which means I can't use my cool pointer. There we go. Um, so, uh, the build scan has a, a, a ton of information. I mean, like a whole summary of the build, the full console log, Tons of stuff, again, free, scans.gradle.com, check it out. Um, but this is the section specific to performance, where it's gonna break down a bunch of details about how the cache behaved. Uh, this happens to be a screenshot from the remote cache working. Uh, you can see that the remote cache actually uh, pulled three operations, and we can see some data on how that happened. So this will be relevant in a moment when we do the remote cache demo. Um, but you get sort of an idea, at least, of what's visible to you in the build scan. I'm sorry we couldn't see more. Uh, without the Wi-Fi. Um, all right, particularly effective for multi-module builds. Uh, we're gonna just dive a little bit more into some of the screenshots and look at a couple more of the scenarios that we kind of teased a little bit in the, um, in the keynote. Um, but I mean, obviously, the, the more untouched stuff that's uh, is not part of the, a dependency chain, uh, the more value, the more stuff you're gonna be able to pull from cache, right? This is another uh, good benefit of building modularly where, where possible. 
Uh, so to break this thing down, we have an example uh, application. It could be implemented in Gradle or, or Maven. Uh, in the case of Maven, there's a four modules, core, service, web, export, API. Uh, Gradle setup would look sort of like this instead. Um, so, and again, just make sure we fully understand uh, the dependency relationship here, because I know it has been a couple of hours and a bunch of good sessions between that and the keynote. Um, here's the core. Uh, export API rely, uh, depends on core. Service depends on core. Web app depends on service. Nothing depends on export API. It's a leaf node. Nothing depends on web app. It is also a leaf uh, module. Um, and uh, under normal circumstances, when anything changes anywhere in any of these modules, and we do either a Gradle clean build, right? not necessarily taking advantage of the incremental, but a clean build, or any Maven build, everything has to run. Okay. What about changing a public method and export API? Right? Well, it's a, it's a public method. So that means that, um, that but, it, but, but it's also a leaf module. So, so nothing depends on it. Okay. So we have to do everything for the module. We, we change public method, so we have to recompile it, recompile its test, run its test, run check style against the source. But all of this can come from cache. All right. Public method and service module upon which web app uh, depends. We do have to compile service, and we have to recompile the dependent module. We have to recompile both of the tests, and we have to run both of the tests. We change the service source code, so we have to run its check style again. We do not have to check style the web app because we didn't change its source code. So coming to the check style task of web app would generate the same cache key that it ran on the previous run because nothing changed. Right? So we would just be able to pull the output from cache instead. And then for core and export API, all of this would come from cache. Implementation detail, not a public method. Implementation detail of the service module. All right, what happens here? Well, we change the code, we have to compile it. We did not change the test code, nor did we change the public method. So we don't have to compile it again. This will generate uh, an identical cache key from before and we'll pull it from cache. We do have to run the test. Right? And we have to check style it because we did change the source code. Not the test code, but the source code. And we have to run the test on the dependent module, but we didn't change its source either and it wasn't a public method. So we do not have to recompile it. So we, can only, we only have to do these, uh, these four tasks. Everything else we can pull from cache. Implementation detail and core, a little bit more invasive. Implementation detail, not a public method change. We have to run all the tests, and we have to check style and compile our core module. Don't have to recompile the test, and we don't have to do any of this. All of this can come from cache. And then, of course, our most invasive change, uh, changing a public method in the core module, at least we can save on these check styles and pull those from cache. Uh, but this is pretty much the most Im invasive thing that we can do, and we still get a little bit of benefit from cache there. All right. Uh, so integrating, and you know, this was originally kind of conceived as something where we would talk about the remote cache node with respect to CI, and I think that that still like, applies, and it certainly applies to Jenkins, and we're going to talk about Jenkins. Uh, but I also want you to allow your thinking to uh, to expand out to also considering things like just ephemeral environments in general. All right, maybe I have some other build pipeline that's not powered, maybe I have GitHub Actions. All right? Maybe I have some other build pipeline that's not powered necessarily by Jenkins. Maybe it's creating ephemeral environments where, and here's the important part, a local cache doesn't provide a lot of benefit because I'll create that cache locally in my .gradle directory and then upon completing my artifact, that environment will be completely obliterated and will never exist again. So the cache will get blown away too, right? So I want you to think about with, with this pattern, sure it works with Jenkins, but it really works with any ephemeral environment that's involved in your build because you're storing the cache outside of the environment. That's the whole point. Right? Uh, so the CI pipeline also in this case can populate that remote cache um, and speeding up then these builds is really just as easy as configuring as many remote cache nodes are necessary to support um, all of the users. It just becomes a, a scaling issue at that point, right? And you can get super creative where, you know, stick these nodes, you know, in different cloud availability zones and, you know, geolocated closer to certain development organizations. I mean, there's all kinds of great network topology, path optimization logic that you can do there too. Um, uh, and this is kind of what that picture will end up looking like. So, 
uh, you know, here is uh, the remote cache uh, node. Come on, don't fail me now. Cool red button. Oh, well. Uh, here's the, um, the remote cache node serving uh, multiple users with a build pipeline, in this case powered by Jenkins, but again, could be powered by anything, that's populating the remote cache from the source code that's coming in from these builds. Uh, could you also technically have all these developers pushing directly to the remote cache? Yes, but why would you? Right? You could do that, but you'll probably overwhelm the node because there's going to be a lot of writing to a single node, and everything's going to probably pass through CI before it gets down to other developers anyway, so you may as well just have CI have the one point of entry uh, and then the whole thing is a lot less chaotic. So. Okay, I'm gonna look at that, look at that too. Uh, this is uh, the command. Um, I, I only put this because there's actually a couple of problems with the command that was uh, within the documentation. Um, so, so definitely, even if you're planning on going back and referring to the documentation to try the home game later, please take a picture of this slide. You will figure it out. You'll probably just waste 10 minutes doing it, and I don't like to waste people's time. Um, this is actual, just right out of the box, this will just work. Uh, it'll pull the, um, the image down uh, from Docker and it will publish it on port 9091. Uh, just keep an eye on build cache node version and stuff. Um, it, it does get updated. If you choose to go this route, when you run the thing, uh, take a look at your log output uh, when you actually go in and, uh, and, and run the, the, the Docker command itself and once you actually can do a Docker PS and you see the thing running, do a Docker logs against the container because your username and password are gonna be in there and it's gonna generate a new one for you uh, for every environment, okay? All right. So let's look at that. Okay, so just looking, I'm just a quick pass at the uh, uh, the, the Docker config. Uh, what am I doing? Um, you can see that, that this is the build cache node. Um, it's the same 17.1 version that was just in that command. It is up and running, and it's forwarding uh, uh, from 9091 locally. Okay. And we saw that that worked um, when we actually hit up the web interface. You do have some basic stuff in here that you can do. Um, you can connect to a central commercial tool. We won't talk about that. Uh, uh, you can also do what you're spend more of the time, which is purging data and things like that within the cache, right? So uh, uh, coming in and making sure that everything's clean, which we should go ahead and do that because we're about to do a, a demo of this. Some basic um, settings about the cache itself, target size, and you know some some housekeeping, as well as a manual access control list, uh, and and a few things like that. Okay, uh, so this will be available to you as soon as you run the Docker command. Once you have this, you have to configure your uh, project to actually uh, use it. Um, now to do that with a Gradle project, um, it's just a matter of making sure that we are pointing, let me make sure I'm in the right, in the right project here. Yes. Um, it's just a matter of making sure that the remote cache node settings are pointed to the right external server. This is another little bit of weirdness if you've worked with remote cache nodes in Gradle and you might be used to using the commercial tool. One of the things that you'll notice is that built into the plugin you already have a context for a build cache object, um, but this is expecting um, this object to come from like a, like a central enterprise, uh, Gradle Enterprise Server node. If you're using the remote build cache node from Docker, then you actually have to just give it a generic. It's gonna just this HTTP build cache object uh, and then populate um, flags like, for instance, the URL, which is in this case pointing to localhost 9091 slash cache, which is where the service address uh, for the actual cache node is, okay? And then that's all you need to do. Uh, I mean, this is running locally, we're not doing SSL, we're not doing, um, uh, we're, we're not doing ACL or any of that, uh, and we're also directing our build to um, push into the node. Why might we want to turn this off? Same, same range to enforce the, uh, enforce the architecture that we saw here, where users are reading from the remote cache, but the only thing pushing into the cache is CI, right? So we would want to override CI's build configuration to say push equals true, but we would want our users to be using a, co a configuration that's push equals false. Can you all, is it a really good idea to just write a single plugin and just handle all this through the plugin and just have your users load a plugin? Yeah, definitely. Really good idea to do that. Um, okay, 
so we see that we've got our cache node running. Uh, it's, we, can, we can hit it. We have an address for it. We're configured to use it. Um, so let's, let's do a couple of uh, gymnastics here. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to run a build again um, because we know that we populated the local cache, but we want to make sure that we populated the remote cache too. So we're going to run this. It ran quickly. If we had a build scan, then we could say for absolute certain that we populated this. Or we could also dive into some other uh, commands that we're not going to do. Um, but the next thing I want to do then is blow away my local cache. So I'm going to come back and uh, run this first command that we saw during the local demo, which was just clearing out the local cache so that I could populate it again. Um, we're going to clear it out, but now we're going to run a clean build. And um, lo and behold, we uh, were able to um, um, we did not pull stuff from cache. Why did we not pull stuff from cache? There we go. Uh, so just so that there's no smoke and mirrors there, let's um, remove the local build cache node again. That's what we're doing right here. Right, so there's nothing stored locally. The only thing that we have now is in the remote node. If we pull this up and refresh it, we can even see that we have three entries in here that we just populated. If I had a build skin, I could prove it even more. Uh, but now we're going to run the build again, and we see that sub-second execution time, even though we'd cleared a local cache, because we were able to pull that from the remote cache node. Okay. Again, without network entitlement to a commercial server, I can't show you the same dance with Maven. Um, but you can do, again, very similar things with the, um, with the community-provided plugin for the build cache node for Maven. Questions on any of that? Yeah? How does uh, the cache work with branches? Like having a master branch in your CI and a PR branch? Well, I, you'll, you'll conceivably only be running the build itself against one of those branches. So the cache key that you generate is within the scope of that single build branch or whatever, because it's only matching against the inputs to the task. So in other words, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you wouldn't be able to share it against multiple branches, obviously, because there's going to be potentially differences in source code. But if there's not differences in source code, then yes, you could even take advantage of, of the cache from that one task. It, it is that elegant. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't, by elegant, I mean dumb. It, it really doesn't know anything like outside of the one scope of that one task. Hey, I'm generating this key based on these inputs. I found a match and I'm taking it. That's, that's why it works remotely distributed as well. Good question. Anything else? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, the question is, can you add users to the server? Um, Uh, yes, with the commercial version of the tool, yes. Uh, not with the, the freely uh, distributable Docker image, but yes, uh, it's available in the commercial tool. So uh, the question is, can I use this for a Maven server? Yes, as long as I have network connectivity to a commercial server with entitlement. Uh, the Maven uh, remote build cache node is a commercial only feature. Uh, but for, for Gradle, th there's also a community-provided open source build cache for, for Maven, which also works great, just not remotely. Another question? All right. So I think we are getting pretty close to the end. We are. Um, that's actually pretty much all that I have to show you without repeating a ton of what we already kind of did in the keynote. Um, but I will say one more uh, scan of this thing. Um, if, if this stuff was interesting, um, what you learned about DPE here or, or in the keynote, um, this really is fun. You know, it's like 11 or 12 stages, if I remember correctly. Little challenges that'll take you through uh, free bits of knowledge. I think I actually forced you to watch one of my videos at one point. Um, and then uh, answer a couple of questions about DPE here and there. It's all self-paced, self-guided. And I think you get like 2,000 points for going through the whole thing, which is like 60-ish bucks worth of swag. Uh, and it's not just Gradle stuff that you can order from the store. You see like Legos and stuff. I think we just added like the Mandalorian helmet Lego set 
as well as the Titanic Lego set. Uh, and when you go through that program, you get dumped into a bigger program if you want to earn even more points. Great stuff. Uh, if you didn't get a chance, I saw a few people. Um, I, I didn't flash this fast enough. Um, this is the blog article where Netflix was using caching um, and test distribution uh, to, uh, to speed up a build, a test cycle time, actually, from a 62-minute uh, test cycle time down to less than five minutes. And I mean, again, just looking at some of the math that we saw earlier in this part of the presentation, I mean, hopefully that sinks in like what, 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 that, what that unlocks uh, for a development organization's ability to, to refine with their, their work. Um, so I'll just give everybody a moment to finish that. Uh, this is kind of fun. Um, you can try uh, against a commercial instance once you have Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, and uh, this is kind of neat. You can go through, hook a project up to a commercial instance, Maven or Gradle. Uh, you'll see what kind of cash savings you get out of the box. And if you send us a screenshot, we'll send you another swag kit with like cool socks and a t-shirt and stickers and stuff like mug, I want to say. Um, we do have like a learning center for all this kind of stuff too. Uh, there's probably plenty of call to action though, so we'll go ahead and call it done. And I am going to stick around a little while longer if there are more questions and I'll be at the conference. But again, thank you so much. I really appreciate the interest. I love the standing room only. And, and thanks again for letting me be a part of the, uh, the 20th uh, anniversary of JFall.